Yeah, and not to be able to grow. That's always a good thing. My name is Sharon Alsop, and I'm from uh, uh, King and Queen County, I'm the Board of Supervisors. And uh, we are here today about connecting um, uh, counties to the uh, internet. Um, as most of you all know, uh, or may not know, King and Queen County uh, went off on its own and did this uh, a couple of years ago and set up our own um, uh, uh, rural uh, wireless broadband service. And uh, I'll tell you, it's made a, a big difference to the county of King and Queen, a small rural county out in the middle of the peninsula. And so um, I'm happy to see that this has generated a lot of interest because I can't tell you about the world of difference that it's made, especially for someone like me who now gets to work from home and uh, most of the time and, and send my, my uh, data in through the internet. Um, so today we have a good panel together. We've got, we have uh, three speakers. Let me go to the second read. Um, we have um, Christopher Kyle sitting on the end. And he's the Vice President of Industry Affairs and, Regula and Regulatory. He um, is responsible for negotiating programming agreements and is the primary contact with local, state, and federal legislators and regulators. He joined the company in 2003 and has led projects and acquisitions, business development, long-range uh, planning, and the Chantel Cable Marketing and Sales. Um, he, has, he began his career in 1994 and his experience in telecommunications, consumer products, and investment banking. He earned an MBA from Randolph Bacon, MBA from uh, Durham School of Business at uh, UVA, and has held positions at Cable and Wireless, uh, Broad Slate, and Craigie Inc., uh, which is bb &T. He serves on the boards of the Shenandoah Valley Partnership, Go Virginia Region 8, Sunnyside Retirement Communities, and the Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Sitting um, right here um, to my uh, left is uh, Marshall per Purcell, He's the senior project manager at KC Communi KCI Communications Infrastructure. Um, he began his career in communications in 1988 with Contel uh, Telephone Operations as part of the real estate and construction team developing remote uh, switch facilities. In 1995, he transferred to Contel Cellular <laughs> and has become Verizon Wireless, uh, and, and, which has become Verizon Wireless. Uh, to lease, zone, and permit wireless towers throughout Virginia, eastern northern, Virginia, uh, northern Carolina, and parts of West Virginia. In February of this year, he retired from Verizon Wireless to pursue a career with KCI Communications Infrastructure as a consultant. And running late, we will have um, the Honorable Kathy uh, J. Byron. She's with the uh, Virginia House of Delegates, of uh, uh, District 22. Um, Kathy has been a member of the Virginia House of Delegates since 1998. She represents portions of Bedford, Campbell, and Franklin counties, and the city of Lynchburg. She serves as vice chair of the House of Commerce and Labor Committee, and is a member of the Finance Committee and House Science and Technology Committee. Delegate Byron also chairs the Virginia Broadband Advisory Council, serves on the Tobacco Commission, Workforce Board, and many other commissions and boards. So today we're going to um, invite um, Marshall to, uh, Pearsall to come forward and, and say a few words to us about um, this whole thing about connecting our counties to Broadband. Good morning, everyone. Um, getting ready to, to start off with an exciting topic about wireless infrastructure. A lot of the content that's in this presentation, probably you all know, I hope that there are some <coughs> facets of the presentation um, will, will um, be a surprise to you. Um, we go through the history of the infrastructure, what we know today, and the future. Uh, just to go over some terminology of, of the different elements of the wireless infrastructure. Yeah, we've got the, the tower is the is the, the foundation of the wireless wireless foundation or the wireless network. Um, with the evolution of, of the technologies, I prefer to call them wireless support structures because the the, the nature of the tower industry is changing. Um, when you mention a tower, people will come back and immediately think of a traditional tower, self-support, monopole. Um, but there are all types of um, options to the industry to deploy um, antennas on the support structure. We've got antennas um, that, of course, is, is the mechanism by which the wireless signal is deployed. 
coaxial cables, and the cables that you see that are mounted on the towers, it's providing connectivity from the antennas to the equipment. Uh, remote radio heads. Um, this is probably the, the greatest um, improvement in the deployment of the wireless signal uh, that we've had in years. These are devices that look like uh, suitcases that are mounted uh, adjacent to the antennas. And the remote radio heads basically um, amplify the signal so we get a, a bigger footprint and a more robust uh, wireless signal for our customers. Uh, the equipment uh, usually is located at the base of the towers. We've got cabinets, shelters, emergency generators, and last but not least, it's connectivity. This is um, something that is lost on a lot of um, people that the, the wireless industry cannot exist without connectivity. So all the towers need to be connected to the network. And um, historically, there have been three means. It's been copper, traditional cables, microwave, or fiber. These are just some examples of the different towers. This is what uh, I think most people in the company mission tower. Not a very attractive structure. Got macro monopoles. Uh, you know, shows the antenna arrays that are mounted on the poles. There's a rooftop installation on the top of the building. There's antennas up there, so the industry tries to leverage existing uh, structures where possible to employ the antenna locations. This is on a water tank. Um, really like the picture because you can visualize the uh, the remote radio heads which are mounted on these two devices here behind the antennas. You fucking can I'm always asking why wireless support structures needed. And unfortunately, the industry has not come up with a mechanism to avoid towers. Um, you know, they're, they're needed to propagate the wireless signal. And there are two objectives. One is for coverage. The coverage is, is required to provide a wireless signal where one doesn't exist or wireless coverage is marginal in the area. And the other is capacity. And this is... Um, the capacity requirements are driven by customer demand. Customer demand. Um, unfortunately, the equipment can only handle a certain amount of call volume, and once that call volume is completed, um, another tower is required in the location. Sometimes um, capacity issues can be addressed through the addition of frequencies and additional equipment at the site, but if, if the industry has explored all those options, um, then another tower is needed. The history of the infrastructure and the macro networks were built on traditional towers, 100 feet, 400 feet in height. Um, the height was needed to get the largest possible footprint um, out of the structure. As years go by, went by, customer demand increased, and the, the capacity of the equipment was exhausted. Thus, it was needed for additional towers to be built. <coughs> it's a vicious cycle that we created because as soon as you build a new tower, the um, the power of the signal is reduced so you don't get interference with the existing network. So every time you add a new tower to a network, the power is um, decreased, and sometimes with the addition of the new towers, there are possibly holes created within the, ne within the network, which there again initiates another tower in place. And um, this, this cycle has been repeated over the course of the last 30 years. Uh, where we're sitting today is a, is a really good example of this progression. In 1995, the tower was deployed on top of the Plum Mountain above the homestead. Worked fine for a couple of years. Customer demand increased. Another tower was added on the, at the ski slopes 10 years later. Then an in-building system was added to the tower, into the, into the homestead facility. And another tower was erected within the town itself. And this is the, the progression um, as customer demand grows, the additional internal support structures are needed. The history of the technology uh, started out in uh, 1983 with uh, the analog devices, and um, it's a great system, but uh, it was very uh, easy to uh, hack into, have fraudulent activity <coughs> in those analog networks. Came up with the digital um, signals, you know, 1X, 3G, um, was rolled out, and we're currently in the, in the world of 4G and LTE, and um, a lot of the devices now are, are voice over LTE. Uh, there again, the, the technology is evolving, and there are plans within the industry to actually phase out 1X and 3G <coughs> by 2024. So those, um, those devices, or those, that technology will be gone. And, and devices, I mean, you know, who would have thought years ago that you know, we would have had to, to have devices like 
bag phones. How many people remember you know, that walking around your car? Or the, um, you know, that monster. <laughs> and, you know, that was state of the art technology. And uh, if you had one of these, you were somebody. And, you know, if I was a betting man, I would have thought that the way that the industry was going would have been this device. StarTac. Short, sweet, uh, small, can stick it in your pocket, easy to lose. Antenna never worked very well, but uh, it was a great device. And I would never have thought 15 years later I'd be standing in front of y'all with an iPhone 8 Plus. It's like a miniature laptop mounted on my head. So, um, you know, the, the devices and the technology are constantly evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. So what we know today on the Yeah, the history of we know that the technology is constantly evolving, but the infrastructure should remain the same. We still need the antenna support structures and we still need the connectivity, which is either copper, or microwave, or fiber. And what we know today, the demand for wireless coverage is increasing exponentially. Um, traditional towers should still be needed to be uh, built to provide capacity, um, but we've added small cells to the mix. These are smaller structures, uh, smaller equipment, um, very uh, uh, not very intrusive to the environment. Um, most of the small cells are being built currently and deployed. It's about 4G technology. In the future, there will be the support structures of the, the platform for 5G. You know, today, the, the macro network is still continuing. It, it's, it's the umbrella um, network that will never go away. It, it is the, it's the robust and hardened network that's going to survive um, natural catastrophes. Um, you know, they, they all have, the uh, majority of the sites have emergency generators, battery backup. Um, it's very reliable. The small cell network is basically the underlay. There, there are devices that are being, equipment that's being installed provide um, capacity offload to, to dense urban areas. This is a diagram that shows you the, the concept um, how the micro, micro network signals exist above and the small cells is closer to where the customer base or the customer demand is. These are some examples of small cells that are located on the utility pole in downtown Richmond. Uh, this is another um, small cell installation. You can see they've got the equipment cabinet. Um, at the base, the remote radio heads at the top of the antenna. Um, it's, it's very uh, minimal installation. Uh, this is an installation small cell with the antenna sitting on the top of the, the apartment there. Uh, this is an installation that's actually in the National Historic District. And the antenna is located in that chimney there. It's a photo chimney. It's uh, made out of fiberglass material that allows the signal to propagate. Very easy. Uh, Seal and uh, it, it's a, a very nice option for the industry. Your another set of devices that are coming around and revolving. They're called micro wireless facilities, and these devices will be mounted on existing strands for the utility infrastructure. On, um, basically, on this side is the equipment that's required, and this is the antenna. Well, once again, the industry is trying to utilize existing structures. Um, but there again, this is applications probably uh, you know more applicable to dense urban areas. <coughs> and again, the summary for the day: the, the demand thing is, uh, you know, the technology is increasing, or the demand is increasing at an exponential rate. <coughs> more antenna locations are needed. And what has not changed? There we go. Fiber connectivity and the need for antenna locations. As you can see, I'm repeating the theme. <coughs> um, future technologies, we have 5G. A lot of people think about 5G, and you know, 5G is just basically the protocol for the operation of a radio. That's all it is. It's uh, really not uh, um, any specific device. The industry is just trying to develop how they're going to allow different frequencies and different technologies to flow through the radio. And um, if we, the industry achieves what they want to achieve, um, they'll be able to have lightning fast, you know, speeds and, and huge uh, bandwidth. Um, you hear a lot of things about Internet of Things, a lot of chatter about this. What does it mean? You know, it, it, it's basically devices.
talking to each other. And it's going to facilitate the deployment of autonomous vehicles, um, connected vehicles, intelligent transportation systems, and smart cities. And you know, the industry is uh, projecting that by 2020, there will be 30 billion devices out there that will all float on the 5G platform. So you know, future applications for this new technology, you know, education, you know, economic development. You know, I think it's all about efficiencies <coughs> and connectivity. So you've got healthcare, municipal infrastructures, tourism, entertainment, a lot of great things coming down the pipe. But the problem is none of this future technology is going to exist without a robust fiber network and antenna locations. It's key. It's what um, is primary for uh, the industry to focus on for. Yeah, I love this quote. I saw it, I took some liberties with it, but um, this gentleman, I think, said it best. He says, it's really, we don't know what's down the pipe. We don't know what the technology is. And 15 years ago, I never thought that I would be able to walk around with a phone on my, my hip, take photographs as good as any digital camera, transport data, you know, operate seamlessly from a mobile device, people thinking that I'm in the office. It, it, it's incredible technology. So my thought is, is that we really need to prepare for what's going to surprise us. And the only way that we're going to do that is to have an extensive you know, fiber network and a multiple <coughs> of locations. Thank you. <coughs> we're going to wait until the end, I think, and take questions. Um, we will have uh, Christopher Kyle come forward. It's great to be here this morning. Uh, you can't beat the homestead and you know, it's full of beautiful leaves that are out here. I don't have any props like Marshall had. He's always upstaging me. Um, but what I, what, a couple of things I wanted to say is I want to talk about things that you want to talk about. I've got some slides up here, but they're just meant for conversation. <coughs> Raise your hand if you want to go in a different direction. If you have a question, I'm all for it. It's good to see you again. Hey, Chris, how are you? Um, I, I think I'm here, to, I'm not really sure why I'm here today. I think I'm here today because we had some really good conversations around a wireless topic that Dean, uh, Michelle Gowdy from BML Joe was in Phyllis. And what I realized early on is that in these conversations, I wasn't really speaking their language and they weren't really thinking how I was thinking. And I can't tell you how many times the Dillon Rule Law State topic came up, and I would have to like digress to think, you know, think about that and, I, and how when I was talking about standardization and you get outside of municipal boundaries, how that can cause complications for a provider like Chantel, and I'll show you our map here in a second. But I think that's real important today uh, and going forward is having more of these conversations in smaller group settings so that we're all speaking the same language. And that's really all I want to accomplish today uh, with some of, these, some of these slides. So we're a rural provider in Chantel. I, I'm going to show you our map so you can kind of see where our perspective is. I said rural earlier. What's blue here is our wireless. We have a large wireless subsidiary. We just upgraded. We bought Intellis last year. We just upgraded all that. We're 4G. Marshall was talking 4G earlier. Uh, that basically, I'm, I'm going to talk about some speeds and technologies in a second. Uh, but what that means to us is that that is a form of 10 minute and up speed and stream video to your phone. They're, they're big cities talking 5G right now. There are plenty of rural cities that don't have 4G right now. So it was real important for us to get all of these markets up to 4G, which we've done. The red line uh, is our fiber network. We've got over 5,000 miles of fiber. We think that's real important. That's our interstate system. Doesn't matter what else we do if we don't have an excellent, redundant, um, this, this fiber system is uh, 100 gig enabled. We push a lot of traffic. James Funkhauser's in the back. We've got a booth here. Anything, the other thing I wanted to say is anything I bring up today that maybe you don't want to ask a question from the group, we'd like to continue the conversation outside of this area. Um, but so that's our red, that's our fiber network, and it's connecting not just wireless, but in the yellow. That's our residential um, play, uh, from cable, mostly cable modem, but we do some fiber to the home also. Um, and a little bit of DSL. So it's interesting to me that we touch a lot of different technologies, and here we get, you know, <coughs> taking you out of maybe where you're comfortable with and, and talking a little telecom. There are trade-offs to these technologies. And, uh, and so I, I wanted to throw this slide up here. Um, 
and on, on the upper half, we've got the wireline technologies in our industry, and the bottom half, we've got wireless, which Cornell was just in. And so I said they're trade-offs. Um, with rural areas, when I think covering a lot of people where there are not a lot of people, I think wireless has got to be part of that answer. Right? And, and you, you brought that up. But and a lot of times, they're not going to deliver the speeds that we're seeing in the media. And we're seeing you know, a lot of people at least want to talk about uh, with getting up into 500 meg to a gig. That's going to be real hard right now, unless you're talking about some of this 5G that Marshall was getting into. But this doesn't propagate very far in rural communities. So fiber to the premise, fiber to the home. A lot of talk here. This is going to be your leading speed product right there. It gets you towards that gig-enabled um, area. Um, just below this is the cable mode, lots of advances. I love what Marshall was saying, that one element of things are constantly evolving and improving. We're seeing that in terms of the speeds that all of these technologies can push. And you can see this here with the cable modem. You know, today we've got over 100 meg rolled out under cable modem. To any business, we offer fiber services and we can get to the gig uh, speeds to any business. But for residential, you know, we're at 100, 101 meg speeds today. We're going to roll out DOCSIS 3.1, and you can see the speed um, benefit that you can move up once you make that investment in DOCSIS 3.1. Um, this is an old uh, flip. If anybody that's been around for a while, the T1 speed, we thought we were doing well. We need to deliver 1.5 to a business that would be 1.5 megabit. It's not gigs. But, uh, and then here's your DSL. We, we do DSL in Shenandoah County. Um, we were one of the first providers to 100% DSL, and, and we understood the limitations. You can see the speed limitations here. You know, this this is really if you're close, really close to where what's called the CO is. DSL is distance limited. So the further you go on the DSL network, the, the speeds fall off and rather drastically. When we compete against DSL, a lot of times we're seeing DSL speeds in kind of three to five meg range versus the 100 meg cable in the limit. And then here we go down to 3G, 4G. I was talking 4G. You know, this this is showing the 50 meg. We see a lot. You know, I'll say in our in our experience, 10 meg with 4G is a good standard experience. But you can see the, the enhancement of the 5G will bring. And then there's some TV white space. Really interesting things happening with TV white space. Does that make sense? I think that I think that's a good kind of graphical representation of what's going on in our industry when we talk broad, the different ways we can deliver broadband. So we deal in the rural areas and we, we deal with challenges every day and, and if there was, let me first say, I was driving down this morning and I was behind a truck and I think he was carrying some kind of hazardous materials and it was a, it was a sign that looked very much like this. Basically, if there's an accident, you know, get away. And I, I, that's not the purpose here. I think <laughs> the purpose of this chart is I think there's a triangle of players uh, in the areas that we operate in. The municipalities, the town, the counties, uh, the gov local governments, the electric companies, and then the broadband providers. And I think there's a lot more that we need to be doing, all three of us, if we're going to really deliver what the consumers need and want, whether that's for health care, whether that's for home entertainment, whether that's for economic development or education. And you know, what I love about some of the things that Delegate Byron is doing is trying to pull those people together to a table to sit down and have some very frank conversations. Because not, none of us, and the Chantel's not for none of us are perfect, and I think that the only way we're going to solve some of this is through conversation. There's some subsidies that need to happen and are happening. I'm going to talk about that. But this is one thing that I want, want to emphasize here. And, and you know, it could be very, very simple. Some of you own electric grids. The uh, town of Bedford, we were working through an issue. We uh, quoted a business that was going to bring five jobs to the town of Bedford, $10,000 to get um, broadband to that business. And uh, Bart called me up and he said, how can this be? You know, you've got the town covered. Well, I said, well, it gets back to the electric company having to move wires, and that $10,000 is just a pass-through. And he said, well, let me make a few calls. And we got, we got into a few things, and, you know, I don't think we were communicating back to them that, you know, these were just pass-through calls, and they can do things differently or more efficiently. The business doesn't need to pay that. And so I think what we've got to keep in mind is, 
you know, who are we trying to serve here? And for us, it's create jobs, it's, you know, you know, keeping people in local communities. Uh, and broadband is one piece of that puzzle. And so we worked that out. Similar story in Roanoke City, um, you know, where you know, we were working through a telecommunications uh, ordinance and just being able to you know, have that relationship with an open and ongoing conversation to push that through. We lit 30 schools up in Red Oak City in less than six months. It was a lot of work and a lot of obstacles to, to overcome on both sides. So again, how, how that triangle needs to work. Incentives and subsidies, I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but two big areas. There's CAF2 in Virginia, that's the Connect America Fund that should kick off here late, mid to late next year. I'm going to show you where that is. Uh, and then Virginia, whether it's Virginia Tobacco or the Madden Grant. I'm working on a Virginia Tobacco Grant right now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's good, good stuff. And then, what's the FCC doing to try to standardize? Some of our conversation on the wireless side got to this issue of, well, certain municipalities have different needs and wants. And, and there are very good reasons for that. I didn't truly understand that. But when we go and roll out a network, we don't begin or we don't start or end on a municipal boundary. So the more we can standardize this, the more it can help us, you know, more efficiently cut through an area, if that makes sense, or serve an entire area. That some may be in the town, some may be in the county, some may be in multiple towns. Does that make sense? <coughs> This is such an eye chart. I'm sure that you can, anybody in the back see any of this? Let me just, let me just try. We can see some of this stuff that we're doing. Um, has anybody seen this map before? Put out by the FCC. So we cut down anything in yellow. There is government <coughs> available for building broadband that Verizon turned down for wireline base. It doesn't have to be for wireline. Um, you know, you can bid this based on fixed wireless. Whatever the technology, going back to my earlier slide, that you can meet at least, um, I, I believe it will be 25 feet from down to 10 1. But right now it's 25 feet. So, cutting down from Lynchburg, you can see plenty in the, in the Richmond area, South Side area, and it's coming down here. This is you know, Southwest Virginia. And, uh, you know, I think that it is it's going to be, here's Harrisonburg up here. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to this option. And if, if you think there may be some interest, and what, I, what we're trying to work on is pulling together partners, uh, whether that's you know, electric co-ops or whatever, to figure out what's the best, most efficient way for us to roll out some service, broadband-enabled service in this yellow, not do it all on our own. Because I, again, I, I think that's a central theme that when you're talking rural areas, uh, it, it, it's going to take teamwork to, to do this to the most rural areas. So that's the cash to auction, uh, there's a website uh, link that we can get out to you. There's some really interesting <laughs> things happening in Virginia uh, that are Virginia specific uh, run through Richmond and, and the Virginia Tobacco Grants now set a 10 million the, the application deadline. Who, who knows about this already? You know, a few. Everybody needs to know about this. Uh, if you're in the tobacco, I guess I should say if you're in the tobacco region. Um, uh, 10 million, and I'm going to come, if you're not in the tobacco region, i got something, you know, very similar program, and that's the PHDA. Um, but the, the deadline for that's the 15th uh, for extending broadband in areas that were not CAF2, that do not have uh, broadband today. We, we really, really like this program. I think there's a lot more to come in this area, a lot, lot more to come. So if you're not in the tobacco region uh, today, uh, you, and you're in an area of the rest of Virginia, basically, even though that says a million, Joe was telling me this week, I think there's a... Yeah, so the Department of Housing and Community Development put in a request to the governor to make it eight million per year. So we'll see if that ends up in the right 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 I don't know if Delegate Byron disagrees with this, but as a private provider, we think these amounts need to go up. And one way they're going to go up is by people putting in these applications to show just the sheer need of the subsidies to get the broadband built out. Um, this, this can be wireless or wireline. Last thing I was going to talk, touch on is the USDA grants. Some really interesting things were just announced, and, and this is every year, but this, for this year, you had Scott County Telephone getting $3 million to hit 603 locations. Uh, and it, 
Brother Community Center earlier. I'm a big believer in the community center. Uh, hub and spoke, and what's that? Telecommuting. Yes, and telecommuting. Uh, you know, to give us the stage test, it takes time to build these networks out. And then an, an easy, I shouldn't say easy, none of this is easy, but a fast forward approach to this is getting an aggregation point, a community center that has internet enabled, you can bring people in, right, you know, in their area, and then provide some more time to either do this wireless or wireline build out to their house. Does that make sense, what we're talking about with the community center? So that's Scott County, and then we have another Virginia IGO in the can. Uh, so, you know, I, and I think what we're going to see is just more and more money become available through these conduits uh, because I think people are understanding just the basic economics of building out the water. Hmm. All right. I don't think I did a very good job. I didn't get a single question. I didn't get a single interruption. No one threw anything in there. So <laughs> 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 then I think all three of you all can ask questions. Well, I'm not a good listener, then I guess that's what I'm saying. Thank you all. Yes. Okay, yes. Now we're going to have the Honorable Kathy Byron. Um, as we know that she sits on the uh, Virginia Broadband Advisory Council, uh, it's one of her duties uh, representing. Uh, 22nd um, she's going to come forward and get presentation. Good morning, everyone. We're going to lighten up a little bit here. We're getting too technical with all these um, providers over here. And I'm going to speak more to your language, I think, of government. Um, first of all, any of you in the back, we've got some church seats still available up front here. Please um, take a load off and have a seat up here. And, um, you're not going to interrupt me in any sense, so please feel free to do that. Um, it's great to have an opportunity to uh, talk with you today. Um, try to keep myself from not repeating things I've already said. I'm sure all the technical stuff I won't repeat anyway. <laughs> Let me find out where some of you are from in the room representing certain areas. Who's here from Northern Virginia area? One. We tell the problem that exists there, huh? Okay, how about um, over in the Virginia Beach area? Anybody come that far? We got some. Okay, good. Um, how many in the, the southwest region are here? All right. And then central Virginia? Uh, that's a bigger show. How about over towards the um, Richmond metropolitan area? Anybody from there? Okay. And let's just see plain old rural. How many of you would call yourself a rural community? Okay, that is what really indicates what the concern is and what, what some of the problems that exist today with, um, with broadband. And the reality of it is, you know, and, and I'm not going to be exact here, but somewhere in the 90% of the Commonwealth already has some type of internet connection. And that's apparent in what you're seeing here, and it's the other percentage of the unserved areas is what we are trying to focus on, the most critical areas um, that do not have any coverage at all. Let me talk to you just briefly a little bit. How many of you are familiar with, with the Broadband Advisory Council? Okay, a few of you. Um, there's been a lot of um, confusion over the last year. We're starting to get some focus, and um, I brought a bill last year, some of you in this room might be familiar with, that drew a little bit of attention. I think it was labeled as the worst bill in the, um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia outside of the Speaker's Dog Bill. But um, in the end, I think it, it served its purpose and also um, brought a lot of additional attention to broadband. And I'm pleased to say that we're making a lot of progress. Um, I was put on the Broadband Advisory Council when it was first formed in 2009. And I've been serving on that council ever since, just um, listening, tracking information, trying to advise the governor on how we um, um, get broadband out to some of the hardest areas of the Commonwealth. Um, I remember serving in the beginning just being frustrated with government, in particular with the federal government, because we were so slow. Nothing was happening, and 
you know, we're waiting on maps. By the time the maps finally get done, you know how government works. By the time they got done, the maps changed. So, you know, you were using data that wasn't current, and although it was helpful, it certainly didn't give us the full picture of everything we need to know. Um, the purpose of the council is to advise the governor on policy and funding priorities to expedite deployment and reduce the cost of broadband um, access in the Commonwealth. Um, it came out of the result of a recommendation from the Broadband Roundtable that was established by Governor Kane in 2007 and codified into law in 2009. Um, some of our other duties include monitoring other states and best practices. Um, advise the governor, of course, at the, uh, the end of our year on broadband. Monitor federal level activities. Review and comment on state funded broadband activities monitor regulatory changes regarding broadband, and of course reporting annually to the governor and um, the Joint Commission on Technology and Science. The council is comprised of 14 members. We have four delegates, and that was just changed a couple years ago to put um, a little bit more legitimacy on the committee, have more engagement from our lawmakers, um, to bring more attention during the General Assembly session. Um, we have the Secretaries of Technology, Commerce and Trade, Agriculture and Forestry, representatives from the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association, Virginia Telecommunications Industry Association, the Center for Rural Virginia, Virginia Chapter of WISPA, which is the wireless and local government. Um, right now the council members are myself, Senator Frank Rupp is Vice Chair, Delegate Jennifer Boisco, Delegate James Lefwich, Delegate Randy Minshew, Senator Charles Carrico, um, Secretary Karen Jackson, Secretary Gooden, Secretary Haymore, um, Ray Lemire represents VCTA, uh, Durant Walton represents VTIA, Christy Morton, Executive Director of Center for Rural Virginia, James Carr, um, CEO of All Points Broadband, and Jane Dittmar, Chair of the Albemarle County Board of Supervisors. So all those folks which carry um, expertise and different viewpoints and different levels of input into um, you know, deployment of broadband and how we get there uh, serve on this council. And it, this past couple of years, I, I really um, feel like we've made progress. We've um, had some um, really good discussions on what some of the um, what some of the different barriers are. So, you know, let me talk, I think you heard a little bit from Verizon about some historical things. I thought it was rather interesting. You know, we talk about technology and it may seem like we can't live without it and it's always been here, but it really hasn't. And I remember back when in my locality in Lynchburg area when our bank didn't even have a fax machine, you know, and now you know, the idea that you even talk about fax machines is very rare in itself. Um, somewhere in either Chicago, Baltimore, or Washington, someone plunked down $3,995 to buy a Motorola Dynatech um, cell phone. And that was the first, you want to talk about the cost of broadband, that was the first handheld um, cell phone that was um, purchased, and that was 30 years ago. Um, back in 1984. Um, I don't know who the original buyer was, but I'm sure that maybe that phone is worth a lot more today, who knows. Um, in 1996, mobile phones became a little more defined and better looking than um, they were before. Antennas were shortened, the designs modified, the features were upgraded, and I'm getting a call on my watch, so as you can tell, technology has really changed um, over the course of 30 years. And the same comes true with broadband. Even though the internet has been around for a pretty long time, the first email was sent in the 1970s. Um, it got a lot of attention in the 1990s, and now it's become one of the most important technological developments of all, ta of all time. Um, way back when, we had to dial connection through our telephones, which ran at a slow 56 kilobytes per second. Imagine that. Um, and it made it very difficult, some of the slowest speeds that we had out there, to download anything apart from text. Broadband breathed new life into the internet in the early 2000s by allowing the signal in one line to be split be between the telephone and the internet, meaning users could be online and make calls um, from their cell phone at the same time. 
Um, this led to faster connections, making it easier to browse the internet and download files. Then we were able to download songs, TV shows, and movies at much greater speeds. And today, um, with the young people, and um, you talk about telemed, all the other uses through education and various other um, download of tremendously large files, the internet has become um, just something that is critical to economic development and to our daily livelihoods. Um, technologies that we currently have in use, some of those that we, we were identifying this through our broadband council, you may have heard some of these earlier, um, fixed wireless, um, TV white space, satellite, fiber, cable, mobile wireless, coax, DSL, and of course, um, in extreme cases, dial-up. Um, of course, um, the other thing that was discussed was um, funding. And let me talk about that and some of the other barriers. You know, if it was a good business model, it wouldn't take um, additional funding to really make that all happen because people know entrepreneurs and innovation will um, will be able to sustain themselves. Um, but there are areas that, whether it's the um, topography or other things that have prevented that from being so, that makes it so much more a public-private partnership in order for us to solve those last mile connections that we are having the most difficulty with. Current barriers to broadband deployment that were identified just recently at a summit by the Broadband Advisory Council were um, first of all, we made it a priority that the reaching the unserved was the most critical part of funding. Because if we don't reach the unserved and keep concentrating on just faster speeds, I believe that faster speeds will ultimately take care of themselves. Because they are already receiving internet connections, and in order to get the speeds up, that business model is just going to keep up with the technology and offer different things. And if you don't believe that, start checking into 5G and what's going on in the 5G wireless field. Um, geography, as I mentioned, permitting fees, um, trenching, zoning, conduit related to bridges and tunnels, pole attachments, um, railroad crossing fees, and um, affordability. Some of the state agencies with broadband funding and some other ones were mentioned as well as far as Connect America funds. We have um, the Department of Agriculture, AFID grant, um, the Tobacco Commission, which just recently, um, um, and actually I chair the committee that's going to be looking at the grants. We've been talking about this for a while, and then just recently we were, um, I brought it up for a motion on the Tobacco Commission that it was important that we get back into finding out ways that we could solve the problems in rural Virginia. We did some pilot programs years ago, and many of you know from the rural areas we have a framework that um, was created through the Tobacco Commission. We invested $100 million in that framework with Mid-Atlantic Broadband, and um, that framework helped get a lot of the industrial parks connected, um, brought a lot of connectivity to places that really needed it. And uh, we did a pilot program years ago, and it was in the Alta Vista area, and to this day it's successful. It was um, Sprint, I believe, now CenturyLink, that, uh, that won that grant, and it was a wireless solution, I believe, down in Alta Vista, and they, um, they started with a small area and a population, and were able to make a good business model out of that with the public-private partnership, and today those folks are still receiving service from that original grant. Um, the Virginia Resource Authority, and of course you've heard um, the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, opportunities on the horizon. How many of you have heard about the Transoceanic um, project that's going on? That, now that is really some exciting stuff. We um, had an update on that in uh, the Virginia um, Broadband Advisory Council just recently. And you were talking about um, here's a picture of those of you that can see it. And talking about our port. Our port city is now a digital port city too. In March 2016, Spanish telecom giant Telefonica announced plans to connect Rio de Janeiro and, I don't know if I can pronounce these right, Fortaleza, Brazil to Virginia Beach with underwater cable. In May 2016, Microsoft and Facebook announced plans to build 
I don't know that either. They've got all these things. Maria, M-A-R-E-A, -A, um, a new 4,000 mile long, think about that, 4,000 mile long cable that's going to run under the um, Atlantic Ocean and connect Spain to Virginia Beach. This will be the only landing point on the mid-Atlantic coast. Local government is looking to expand their government facilities using this um, at tremendous speeds and create public-private partnerships to expand north towards Richmond. Mid-Atlantic Broadband is also already working with them to connect some of our rural areas. Um, another area that has brought a lot of attention to it is Go Virginia. Many of you um, in your localities are working with your um, regional groups on Go Virginia. Um, Go Virginia is going to be a little bit tougher with their criteria for um, for broadband um, because they believe that um, let me see what I had here I had something from them they are really going to tie it into jobs and economic development they're not just going to um, you know provide grants for folks unless it really directly ties back to those two things because Go Virginia is really focused on entirely on economic development. Um, I do know that tomorrow I'll be at our finance appropriations retreat, which we have every year to go over um, the budget from the House of Delegates. And one of the presentations for the first time that I can recall in the 20 years I've been there is going to focus on broadband. And I've worked with the staff myself, and I know that because of the discussions and the leadership of Go Virginia and the leadership of the Broadband Advisory Council that I would expect that we're going to see a priority put on some more funding for um, projects that will um, look at the infrastructure costs that will help drive down the costs of um, broadband in the Commonwealth. So I'm real excited about the opportunities that exist on the horizon and the way that we can work together. And that's part of the, um, the discussion that I've been trying to have for the last year and a half. And that's helping you to understand how important it is that localities are ready. I mean, this is just like when we talked, you know, several years ago about transportation and being shovel ready. You need to be ready for these projects. We have the Tobacco Commission grant, and I've been getting a little bit of, and it's only rumor, folks, so don't go out there and quote me on it, but I am chair of the committee. I've been getting some rumors about slowing, you know, slowing down maybe for a month or two. I'm not ready to slow down any broadband deployment. We've been going slow enough. So I'm going to push back on that. I think you need to be ready. I think you need, I've been telling, I saw, Bedford's here, I'm not going to point you out, but I've been telling them, get your application in on time. I can't do your application for you, but you need to get your applications in when there are opportunities in your area that exist. Um, get working on the public-private partnerships. Sit, sit down with Chris. Sit down with the, the folks that are your providers in the area and talk to them and find out, you know, there's been so much divisiveness where people just say, oh, you know, like some of the comments, and I won't get into politics in here, but you're all political anyway, so the, the talk about somebody's bought out. I'm not bought out by anybody. I want to try to help the citizens in the Commonwealth of Virginia to get broadband to their area. The only way we're going to do that is by working together. You have so many, I know the um, restraints and the budget restraints you have in your localities. You don't have the money to invest in all your own broadband. You're, the folks in the South Side don't have the money. We're all trying to get jobs so they can we can keep them there and not lose them and, and give them economic opportunities to, to have their families stay behind too. So we need to work and try to make a business model so that we can let the private sector take care of it, let them operate it, keep the technologies up and everything else. But let's work together to get some solutions done. Um, I'm working on a, we don't have Northern Virginia here, but I'll tell you folks, there's some, some issues going on with the 5G right now that, that local government needs to be aware of. I, VACO sits on our um, advisory council. We've told them to take that message back too. 5G wireless. Some of the biggest problems are zoning. 
with localities coming to an agreement with us on bill. 5G small cell, how many of you know what a small cell tower looks like? I mean, it's so small you can't even tell it exists when they do it properly and put it in locations where you can get faster speeds in some of the more urban areas because that's where it's going to work the best. And we need to try to do what we can in the areas that already have it to get those speeds up too. But some of the big roadblocks we're meeting are with local government. And you guys have to go back to your constituents and say, look, we realize power is important. And when it comes to taking power and money, boy, you can get some good discussions going, can't you? But you need to make sure that your constituents really understand, what do you want? Do you want this? Or do you want, you know, do you want to keep things the way they always were? You're going to have to think outside the box and start compromising on some things that maybe you didn't want to before, but it's a different world today. So that may not apply to some of the areas in here, but um, we're going to have some discussions. And you're going to get some of the same flyers you got last year saying that my bill was the worst bill of the session, and you're going to hear things that I was trying to stop deployment of broadband, which is absolutely ludicrous. You're going to hear the same kind of things, and I'm going to be upfront and honest with you, not politically correct here. You're going to hear the same thing about small cell. And you need to go to the source and find out what the real answers are. We want to solve the problem with you. We're not trying to come along and hurt you know, anybody in your locality. We want to help you. But we're, the only way we're going to do that is working together. Department of Housing and Community Development has done a great job um, working through these grants. It's a brand new field, you know, brand new area where, where there were a couple bumps in the road. The most important thing, if there's any providers in here, we don't want to come along and give government money out to somebody, you know, that, that, that is already being served by somebody else. So they found a way to make sure that they do a 30-day public hearing, that anybody can come forward if that area is already served. The mapping, as you know, there's so much confidentiality in this. Um, the big grant money that CenturyLink got, we're, we're trying to have discussions with them, you know, so we can get a little bit past the pri proprietary information because we really need to know where they are. Um, they got a big award from the federal government and they have some, uh, they have a lot of homes that they're going to hit. They're probably working with some of those of you in here. But if we don't know where that's out, how can we help get to the area that's right next door, that's neighboring that, that can get broadband to? So these are some of the challenges that exist, but they're, um, they're challenges that I think we're finally finding some answers to. The Tobacco Commission put $10 million, and I know they're not going to just give it out very willy-nilly we're going to look for good applications that reach a you know a lot of people that um that'll get the job done and be able to also sustain themselves um i think eventually technology is going to be the actual solution to a lot of the the um the leftover areas and areas that exist but in the meantime we have to do everything we can to allow um, students to achieve what they need to achieve um, as far as education and have all the opportunities and for our businesses to thrive. Um, rural Virginia is not going to thrive unless we allow economic development to thrive in those areas too. So we'll look forward to your questions. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. Thank you so much for coming forward and giving the presentation. Um, we're going to open the floor for questions. But having been the moderator, I'm going to get the first question. I have to have some, there has to be some purpose <coughs> to moderating. Um, first, I want to say um, that I appreciate you for coming, but that, you know, rural Virginia is not just the southwestern side. I come from the Middle Peninsula, Northern Neck area. We have problems, too, in getting, in, getting rural broadband to our areas. Um, and when I hear, you know, Tobacco Commission said, the Tobacco Commission doesn't do anything out there. So, for a lot of us that are sitting here, that really has no play or, or interest to us because we can't we can't access that money. Although my father, my grandfather was a tobacco farmer, we didn't get in on the money when it was done, um, you know, years ago. So it comes back to um, you know you go with a Verizon offering, um, but I can't get Verizon in my house. I have to sort of walk around the house trying to get a signal. But what I've noticed is that I could get a signal, 
But then now that the 4G has come out, they are pulling the bandwidth from our area to, I guess they're giving it to the cities. I'm not exactly sure where they're giving it to, but I know it's not in King and Queen. It's not in King William because I go there. It's not in Essex because I go there. So I guess my problem is all of this that you all have talked about, there are many rural areas that it's just not going to work in. Um, you know, last year we won the award for coming up with a, a, a wireless broadband initiative in our county that we had to fund ourselves. I think it's kind of interesting, and I'm just going to put this out there, that right now what we've seen is I saw cable is now being put past my house. We couldn't get anybody to lay cable past my house. But now that we have a solution that's working, all of a sudden we've become, you know, oh, we're going to going to go on, you know, into King and Queen, because they can see that we've come up with a money maker for us, but um, that was not the purpose. It's because right now, wireless, broad, well, broadband is a utility now. It is not no longer I want to have, it's I have to have it. And so what we're seeing is a lot of the rural communities are, are not having something that everybody else is taking for granted. So I guess my question is, when you're thinking about exactly how you're, you're, you're going to live, I guess I'm asking uh, the two that, that come from company, exactly how are you thinking about laying this out that's going to work for all of rural, rural Virginia? Um, I, I can see by the map that you all have, have spent a little bit of money out in the southwest area. There's, 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 there's the cable laid, but still in, 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 in the middle peninsula, the middle of the net, it's not. At least if there's black powder there, but there's, that's all we have, so we can't utilize it. So I guess I'm, I'm asking what would be a solution that they could come up with, or is the solution that we came up with, uh, you know, the only one that would work? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot in that question. I think it's a good question. Um, I think that question speaks to the complexity of the problem. I mean, I think that's what you're really, there's no easier silver bullet. Um, I think that, and just to be clear, you know, we're not just in southwest Virginia, I didn't touch it, but we're down in the Farmville, Charlotte uh, County, uh, or Courthouse. Um, and, you know, and so there's some south side um, activity, but we're definitely not over, over neck. And I think there's a prioritization that we need to do a better job of. And it really needs to start with this conversation to hear from you. Kathy Byron touched on just a nugget of this is in this prioritization. If we're doing this right, let's talk about the people that can be impacted with the dollars that can be spent. And then let's, in business, what we're good at doing is measuring stuff. Let's start measuring our partners. And so I, I think that you know that's absolutely what you know, Shinfeld is doing. I think if I were to be, you know, critical a little bit, is we're still trying to figure out. This, this fixed wireless approach. I've talked about pros and cons, right? Everything we've done so far is a wireline basis because we are a company that's deep in our DNA, five nines of reliability. When we put something up, it needs to work and work very, very well. Um, the fixed wireless has some trade-offs. Uh, sometimes it doesn't always work, sometimes uh, it gets oversubscribed and you don't get the speeds, but we've all been there, especially when you're talking DSL technology, similar problems with that. I think Chantel, the play in rural areas, we, we are already in, enabling the WISPA, uh, the WISPs that uh, operate, that's a tough word to say, 10 times in a row. Uh, we already enable the WISP because they rely on fiber, we, let them tap it. we want them to tap into our fiber to get out there, but as a bigger company, we're trying to figure out a business model where we play on the wireless side, but I think it gets back to more of a you know a ground level approach of prioritizing these areas of impact that don't have it today. Start putting the names on the list and then be, being held accountable for how we do that. Yeah, that's a question. Can I add to that? And I want to answer a question about a little bit about the funding because I understand that there are a lot of folks that are not in the tobacco region. I also know as a legislator, I hear from Loudoun County, I realize there's a lot of rural territory, even up towards Northern Virginia, that people are not familiar with. They think of all that as populated. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of areas that are farmland or 
long um, routes to get to people's homes. And that's why it's very critical that the state put additional funding in. Um, the other thing that we keep talking about, public private. You know, there, there's a couple other projects that are going on where um, <coughs> Mecklenburg cooperatives are um, working on a project that is going to address a lot of their, they have an application in the Tobacco Commission. I know they're working on a project, I don't know the details of it yet, that are um, the, the, the electric co-ops. They can identify their customers. They know some of those things. Um, Chris can't necessarily identify in an area who his customers are going to be in a small area and if they'll even take it. You know, just because you bring something to an area doesn't mean that people will buy it either. We had that happen up in Loudoun County where um, we heard from one of the other legislators that service came and people were still wanting to use their telephones instead of actually having the service in their home. So you still have to make it affordable to make those kind of investments in the area. That's why wireless will probably be one of the, the bigger solutions for those areas that exist. I know that Danville is working on a project right now that they're allowing, they're going to allow their towers to be used and make it easier and affordable for somebody to, um, to attach to their, their own towers, their 911 towers, and to be able to pro provide service to the people in Pennsylvania County. So there's going to be solutions like that, but I think the thing that we were trying to say too is if you don't already know it or you're not already doing it, and many of you may already be there, is to you know first your localities. And by going in and analyzing, I know Bedford did that, go in and analyze those areas. And it's not going to be a one size fits all. So you're going to have to go out and find this section and this section and maybe the solution to this part of your county that's a different solution for another part of the county. But by you doing that preliminary work, that's how we're going to find, you know, the partnerships that make all that happen. And, and you may end up not finding someone and decide on your own that that's what you're going to manage. And that's entirely up to you. No one is saying, and there's nothing in the law that stops you from doing that. I don't think that's your best choice, but I think that um, that's your option too. But you need to reach out and, and work through those things. One of the areas that I know out here in Smith Mountain Lake that I'm very familiar with, the, the local residents got together and they got a neighborhood, huge neighborhood committed to taking on the service, sat down and worked through months probably with Chris, and now they have service in their area because they took the initiative to come together and make a model that was going to work. And so those are just some of the other things. We've got state money coming your way. You know, probably because there's tobacco money, they'll, they'll shift more of that state money up in your neck of the woods so that we can share the resources and make sure everybody can, can gets Can I interject for one second? Because this prioritization is so critical. So uh, we do go door to door and get people to sign up so they know what kind of rate they're not committing. But just to get an indication of interest. That one community we end up with 70% uh, internet take rates. But we've had other communities we built where it's below 20%. Hmm. Which killed us. And that's why we got to this three minute when we do two stages of uh, signature. But I think through this, there's a, there's a model you can go download uh, from CIT. And it kind of helps walk you through some steps to get you know signatures at the toolkit. And I'm happy to sit down with anybody in local government and talk about our good markets and our bad markets. Um, because of that. I think you need to see both sides. And we're not, I mean, we're in it every day. We're not really sure yet what are the indicators that drive a 50 plus percent of internet penetration market versus something like that. <coughs> My question to, to our development is um, uh, from Pete Blow from Sussex County, and again, we are, have recently entered a partnership with Prince George Electric, the electric cooperative to work through this, and so we're excited about that. But much like your, the chairperson, we are also very, very concerned because we understand, and, and this is rumor, we don't know what the details are, hopefully you can help us, that now, at the state legislature, the big guys, Verizon, yep. Comcast, mm -hmm. and others are pushing legislation that would prevent 
small companies from doing this and that only organizations like theirs could do it. And I need to tell you, in our county, Verizon, the, the first time that someone provides service, even if it's at a higher cost, half of our population is going to do it because of the way that we have been treated. Just like in your situation, once the project starts and we put all these dollars in it, then all of a sudden, now they see their way clear to come in. And we're not happy. And so others need to stand up and not have it as well and, and not allow this to happen. But from the state level, is, is there any truth to this rumor? Or are you aware of this legislation that Jane Cook doing? That may have been a rumor uh, from last year's legislation, and there was not anything in that legislation that stopped that. What it was intended to do, and there may be a difference of opinion in this room, and that's why it's good to talk, the, the, what it would have done was slow the train down because of the kind of discussions we're talking about having. There were some areas that had not come to the table and sat down and tried to um, do a toolkit, analyze their areas, and, and do all that. But it did not, it never, ever stopped locality from being able to go out to their own. However, I will tell you that state funding is directed to um, unserved areas, and it's not being directed to, it's being directed to public-private partnerships and not to government itself as being the entity that manages those, um, those networks. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions because we're going to run out of time, and I'm going to call this gentleman over here. And there was, I thought there was a man over here, yeah, that had raised his hand early. My name is Spencer Murray. I'm from uh, the Eastern Shore of Virginia. We don't have tobacco. We do not in Appalachia. We just pour. That's uh, plain. I have pour. Uh, Northampton County probably the second poorest. We compete with Lee sometimes, but we're the second poorest in the county, uh, in the state. Partnerships are the answer, Delegate, and I believe it with all my heart, but I'd like to know your position on, do you believe that privately funded broadband authorities, which are established under Virginia Code, should be an open access network that does not compete <coughs> for the last mile with the private sector? Yes, it's a yes or no question. <laughs> that local government should not compete with the local... No, local authority, broadband authority, should not, should not compete for the last mile. They are taxpayer funded, as you well know, grants federal as well as state. They, in some cases, if they go in and take up all the cream of the crop, then the ISPs have no reason to invest, and they will not invest. They leave that area, so we end up really with a monopoly, which is currently potentially going to happen on the eastern shore. We have broadband because NASA wanted to talk to North Virginia. Other than that, we'd be the last in the desert would be had broadband before the eastern shore would. But we have it. But we. But it's a policy question about broadband tax funded broadband authorities. Can they live up to being an open access network, or should they be allowed also to compete for the last mile? I do not believe that they should compete for the last mile, because I do believe that the broadband, local government broadband authorities are a great risk to, um, to the areas, because of the, the only examples we have of that are governments that have in, put out a lot of taxpayer money at risk. Amen. And then the private, it's hard to get the, uh, the, the private sector to come in because they are, you know, you can't compete against a limitless supply of taxpayer dollars either. <coughs> working with Congressman Whitman, I know he just recently had a summit over the Eastern Shore. And he's committed to doing what he can. I know future legislators in that area are also very concerned about um, about the unserved in the Eastern well, Shore you, area. Delegate, I hope you will work with uh, Rob Boxham and Senator Lynn Lewis on this very area. It's not just affected the Eastern Shore. If we're going to have partnerships, in, and I'm an advocate of the private sector, that's the only way you're going to have competition, and we've got to have the private sector involved in this, 
Uh, if we don't have competition, if government takes it over and, and allows taxpayer-funded entities to compete with the private sector, we'll never get where we need to be. Thank you for your service. Yeah, no, that's question. a good answer. So you haven't talked anything about satellites, and we hear a lot about low orbiting satellites and space sessions and all that. Where does that play into maybe serving those areas that are not ever going to see wires? I'll take a 30 side. I'm hopeful, but I'm telling you, you know, uh, 25 years of being hopeful of a satellite being able to kill you off a little latency, like we can talk, and, and the higher orbit ones, uh, the latency is just, it's, it's inoperable, especially for business applications, you know, an application you're trying to check email. Elon Musk is a name that keeps dropping up. You know, he's someone that's going to try to put these satellites in and have them orbit. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. It would make my life a lot easier. It would make Baco and BMS, we're talking about all the easements and everything else. But but uh, I see, other than the FCC has put one paragraph in this CAF 2 saying potentially they may let some satellites bid on it. 